Top Bird Talk. Right, everyone. Uh, good afternoon. I hope you've enjoyed your lunch. Uh, it's always a pleasure to uh, introduce the session afterwards and uh, hope that everyone will be suitably excited and uh, stimulated to stay awake and no, no buffet syndrome here. Um, the afternoon session is going to be on uh, quality improvement, which should be um, really quite a splendid session led by some leaders in the field. Um, the first speaker is going to talk on leadership in quality improvement, and that's Carolyn Johnson, who's a consultant in East Lisse at George's and um, is involved in the uh, Royal College uh, Quality uh, Working Group as well as uh, Quality Academy at St. George's. And of special um, importance to her here, I understand that she's known as a Northern Ireland person permanently living in England, which apparently is an acronym I'm not supposed to repeat up here. So uh, (laughs) without further ado, Carolyn. Yes, that acronym is uh, NIPL. So... um, Thank you very much. It's lovely to be in Dingle. I'm a Dingle virgin, which sounds all wrong, but uh, I'm very much enjoying it. Uh, so I'm going to talk today about uh, the development of the Royal Culture of Anaesthetists Quality Network and a little bit more about networks in general, which has been the word of the day so far, hasn't it? There are no shortage of networks around the place. This is just a few of the ones that I'm involved in, either closely involved in or loosely involved in, and many of you will be too. Um, It seems to be the way we're going to solve a lot of issues around here. It seems to be the way that we're going to roll out a number of things. Um, But it's worth thinking about what that actually means, what a network is and what it can do for us. So um, many of these networks will have very different structures and functions, but this bit of research from the Health Foundation, they're going to feature a lot today, Um, talks about what a network actually is. And so the agreed definition of a network there is that a network should have a common purpose, so we should all be gathering around the same common issue. Some kind of cooperative structure, and I'll talk a bit more about structures. You need a critical mass of people, so two people isn't a network, and maybe 10 people is, or 20 people are, depending on what you're doing. You need some kind of collective intelligence within that group, so some kind of sharing of the collective intelligence that you can make the best use of the connections that you have. And you need some kind of sense of community, so that the people in that network are able to communicate with each other and uh, work with each other on behalf of each other and know each other in some way as a kind of collected community. Um, Why do we need them? Well, there's quite a lot of wheel reinvention going on. I think we have a a fairly well-defined set of issues in perioperative care and anaesthesia, and we've talked a lot about them today already. So all of us will be implementing perioperative diabetic clinics or anemia clinics, or we'll all be working on our Royal College of Anaesthetist access standards or whatever they are. We're we're all doing the same things. We're all doing it in parallel at the moment. So, uh, but we're all too busy doing those things to look up and see other people are doing exactly the same thing in the hospital down the road and maybe learn some lessons from them. So there's a lot of parallel wheel reinvention happening. The other reason we need networks is because it's incredibly frustrating to do quality improvement. It is annoying, it is attritional, it results in quite a lot of wine being drunk. And um, I think there's something really special in networks that you get that sense of community that actually you're talking to someone else who shares the same stresses as you, has the same experience as you, and it's just nice to know that someone else is finding it as you are. Um, uh, and you can uh, discuss wine choices after that. So the, the, um, the kind of collegiate nature, the support you get from being in a network is really important, particularly with something like trying to make improvements happen. And the last reason I think networks are really important is, is this. I'm sure you're familiar with this. 17 years it takes uh, knowledge to get into practice is the kind of apocryphal number that we hear. How do we move from having a good idea somewhere to spreading that good idea? Someone somewhere will spread it relatively quickly. How the rest of us can learn from that and spread spread, uh, improvements, but spread basic knowledge getting into clinical practice more quickly. So the idea that uh, a well-functioning network might be able to speed up that process of getting these um, results of clinical trials into regular clinical practice is something that's really interesting as well. 
So I'll just give you a few examples of networks that are out there as a kind of description of the structure and the function. So this is a network that I'm involved in. I'm the improvement lead for the National Emergency Laparotomy Audit. Uh, and we have local leads in every trust in England and Wales um, who are collecting data on emergency laparotomy and giving it up to the mothership to the national audit. And this is a page of our website, um, which has got a whole load of documents on it to share. This is our um, kind of first attempt at knowledge sharing. And if I can highlight there, top tips, patient top tips from the audit. Uh, from the audit. Um, any advice submitted to the audit from top performing sites can be found on that um, little button there. So if you wanted to learn about a site that's doing fantastically in emergency laparotomy, that's where you would go. If I had to draw out how that uh, structure works, I'm going to have a go at the laser here. Um, you've got the national audit there, and you've got a, a lot of local leads in parallel. If they want to learn knowledge from each other, it goes up and down via the mothership. So um, someone has some really great practice, they submit it to us, we share it via the website. If you want to learn about really great practice, you go to the website and we share it with you. So that's a fairly traditional hierarchical kind of network structure. The other one I wanted to talk about is a really different network, is the Health Foundation's Q community. Who's familiar with the Q community? Quite a few. Good, that's great. So this is a new network that's been set up in response to the Berwick report on patient safety, um, led by the Health Foundation and NHS England, which has now got several thousand members across the UK with skills in improvement in a variety of ways. So when that cohort was first set up, we drew a map up with the initial 231 members. We, drew, we were asked who else we knew in the network. So they gave us the list of the 230 names, and we had to tick whether we knew the people on the list or not. And they produced this, uh, this kind of network um, map, I guess. This black person in the middle knows hundreds of people. Uh, all of these little dots here, they knew nobody. These two knew each other. No. <laughs> and no one else. So this was a map of the connections of everyone in this network. So we had three design events where we worked together as a group of 230 to work with each other to develop what this network would look like and how it would work. And at the end of those three events, they asked us again, who do you know from this network? And this was the much more kind of equitable, collegiate kind of um, map of connections that was in the group. So this network is much more uh, organic, it's very messy, but it's full of connections. There's hundreds of people there that know each other, and the, the definition of know each other was well enough that you might drop them an email to ask them a question or, or ask them for some help with something. So what is the purpose of these two different ships? So this slide is stolen from Helen Bevan, who writes a lot about these things. This traditional structure here, the kind of NILA-type network structure, is is often in our organization, these would be divisions. This would be the medicine division, the surgery division. It's designed for divisions. These structures don't talk to each other directly. They are divided by the structure. Whereas this kind of more collaborative kind of spider's web structure, it looks strikingly like the, um, the picture of the Q community, doesn't it? It's designed to connect the people in the network. So they're very different structures, deliberately so, uh, and the structure on the right is much more effective at making the network uh, work as a collaborative, sharing kind of um, a body. So we're moving away from what we traditionally had, which is this kind of quite anatomical approach to how we might uh, shape something so that we have kind of standardized pathways and designs and so on into something that's much more messy, um, and, and you would call it a physiological approach. So you're not looking at what the shape of something is. You're looking at how it functions. So the focus is on how people connect with each other, the outcomes of what they do, rather than the kind of pathways or formal roles and responsibilities. So you're really focusing more on behaviors and connections, which is how human beings work. And this is mirrored by another piece of work which talks about the new kind of leadership that's needed uh, in this uh, kind of much more complex environment where people don't have power through being high up in the hierarchy um, and uh, driving innovation from the top, but this is much more kind of a shared purpose between every member of the network. It's kind of more viral, more grassroots driven. It's very open uh, and cooperative, and it's based mainly around relationships rather than transactions. 
So the potential benefits of us doing that as anaesthetists are that we could spread improvements much more quickly. So that might be that we visit each other. So uh, guys from Southampton here, we visited when we were setting up our surgery school. And Portsmouth came and visited us recently. So these visits are happening already. Uh, That we might share resources with each other, policy uh, drafts, uh, slides, um, uh, patient information leaflets, whatever that might be, and collaborate together. We also know that it would be really important to help local departments, particularly trainees, access QI when they move. So trainees report the main barrier to doing these things is time. And I think if you're going to move to a department and it's already teed up that there's projects ongoing and you can take part in that, it's, it really helps them to meet some of their learning requirements around quality improvement in a foreshortened time scale. And then, of course, importantly, to give each other a bit of help and support when the going gets tough. So we surveyed the membership of the Royal College of Anaesthetists and found that um, there was really good support for this idea. So over 90% of members agreed that it it would be good and it would be helpful, and the majority were quite keen to take up some kind of role. It's probably not surprising to you that they said the main barriers to them doing that were time, but actually a lot of them, they thought the main barrier to them participating more in QI and in a network was that they didn't have the training. So that's something that we can address quite early. Um, We went back to this paper, again, from the Health Foundation, uh, a piece piece of original research they did on leading networks. And it gave us a couple of really core principles that we want to work by. So we set out very early that we should look to share power and leadership across the network. It shouldn't be a hierarchical kind of structure that really what we were about was reciprocity and exchange between members. So I may share some resources with you and you may share some resources with me based around our common, our common purposes. Um, importantly for the network to work, it must meet members' needs. And so we look at why would we need another lead for another uh, initiative in, in a department? Why would someone put their hand up to be part of this network if it wasn't meeting some kind of needs for them? So there's airway leads, there's palm leads, there's quarks, there's research leads, there will soon be a patient safety lead. Why would someone want to take this role? To me, the answer is fairly clear. The reason why they'll take it is because it's helpful and useful to them, and it'll ultimately save them some time because they'll be sharing with each other. And also importantly, we must create some useful outputs. So it's not very uh, helpful for us just to be a bit of a talking chop that we all enjoy talking. We have to create some useful outputs for the, for the college to support us and for other people to want to join us as a network. So we have to be useful. So our first steps, we've recruited regional leads in most of England, uh, Wales, Scotland, and Northern Ireland, one or two regions not represented yet. And we've had a network leadership development day, which I'll come on to. So we have a lead for each region. Um, We have agreed a common purpose, so a kind of purpose statement. And we've started collaborating on some tasks. So we've written written a bulletin article together, and uh, we're in the process of... It's kind of co-creating our job description for local leads, that kind of thing. And our plan is to recruit local leads in every uh, trust in uh, England, Northern Ireland, Scotland and Wales in the coming months. So that's, it's coming to you soon. And it's based around this diagram from the Health Foundation is the, if you remember back, the, the purpose of a, or the definition of a network that we coalesce around a common purpose, that we're looking to get critical mass of people uh, harnessing some collective intelligence and and building the community together. So this is the model that we're working to. I mentioned network leadership support. It was a really interesting thing for us, and that was Ramani Steer, actually, to have that day where we sat down with someone who was an expert in this area and talked about the different kind of skills you need to be a network leader. So you need to kind of... uh, uh, really facilitate connection between other people, that idea of creating a kind of commonality amongst people is really quite a different way of leading than people have done before. So that was a really helpful day for us to kind of coalesce around uh, our purpose. So uh, where do we go from here? We... um, what, what could we do? What could we do with this network? In its simplest form, we could just coordinate some training and some peer support for people. And I think that will be an early task for us. With our local leads, we're going to have some um, uh, questionnaires that go out that ask them what kind of QI activity is going on with them, what QI training opportunities they're aware of. So at the very least, we'll create a map of what's going on out there 
and what people can get involved with locally. We could help people to share best practice solutions uh, fairly easily, be that as written protocols, be that as other bit of uh, paperwork. Um, we, we could help trainees to hand over improvement work as they move through rotations so that the, these bits of work that take a long time are sustainable uh, outside the usual August to August um, time scale. Or we could help scale up successful local work and spread innovations much more quickly. So examples of some of these in practice with other networks. This is the sharing hub from NHS Improvement, which is fairly dry and quite NHS Improvement-y. But there's also one by the Academy of Fabulous Stuff, which sounds much more woo. And um, that's a, a, more of like a wiki where people kind of share their, uh, their good ideas and their innovation. So some of this is happening already in other networks. Um, there's spreading up local improvements. This is the Aussie toolkit to building a handover. So um, that's come out of Australia. So it's not it's not a handover, but it's a toolkit of how you could build a better handover process. So um, you could spread a good initiative elsewhere more quickly. Or we could work even on something like a breakthrough collaborative series. So I mentioned the emergency laparotomy audit. They've actually now rolled out a national program through the academic health science networks to build this kind of collaborative process. So rather than local leads working in isolation, they'll come together and share their, um, their experiences and their best practice with each other directly. Our final lesson, and the point I was going to leave it on, is a little bit less positive. We expect rough roads ahead. We expect some fluctuations in engagement, and we expect some fluctuations in our impact. Um, and we know that we'll need to have quite a bit of adaptability to survive and for this to work in the long term. What works now might not work next year. Uh, and so I think by kind of co-designing this and working in a very collegiate cooperative way, we're best able to kind of bomb-proof ourselves against any um, troubles we have in the future. Thanks. Top Med Talk. Thanks for downloading Top Med Talk. Don't forget to subscribe via your podcatcher. Don't forget to check us out on social media. We're on Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, and YouTube. And also, don't forget, Top Med Talk is the broadcasting arm of EBPOM, evidence based perioptive medicine we'd love you to find out more about that if you check out ebpom.org you can find low prices on some of the conferences we're organizing around the world many of them are virtual and don't even involve you leaving your own home check out ebpom.org now